autumn morning, gloriously bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. Folded the grave clothes, tomb filled with light, as the angels announced Christ is risen. See God's salvation plan, brought in love, born in pain, paid in sacrifice. Fulfilled in Christ the man, for he lives, Christ is risen from the turns from the empty tomb, hears the voice speaking, calling her name, it's the Master, the Lord, raised to life again. The voice that spans the years, speaking life, stirring hope, bringing peace to us. We'll stand to is risen from the dead. One with the Father, ancient of days, to the Spirit to close faith with certainty. Honor and blessing, glory and praise to the King, crowned with power and authority. Love is one, Christ is conquered. And we shall reign with him, for he lives, Christ is risen from the Good morning and let me begin this new year by wishing you a very happy new year and God's richest blessing for the coming weeks and months, whatever they may hold. We don't know, it's uncertain, but we will hold on to God and we'll look to him and he will help us. He will stay by us. The Bible says he sticks closer than a brother. He says, even though a mother could forget her child, God will never forget us. And so no matter what you are look, your year is looking like at the moment, please do remember, God is the one you can look to for the coming year. Let me just say a quick announcement. From Monday the 4th, the week of Monday the 4th of January, Lachie and I are going to be taking a week's holiday. So we'll have our normal service on the 3rd, Sunday the 3rd, and then the following week there will be uh, nothing coming out from us. So no midweeks and there'll be no service on Sunday the 10th. So just a little bit of advance notice. As usual, we'll put out in the email maybe some places you can go to. And I'm sure probably by now that you've got other channels that you watch anyways. So just a bit of advance notice. We're going to begin then uh, in a word of prayer. And it's always a good way for us to begin, but especially at New Year. Think about it. You know, maybe if you look back to 2020, we're going to be doing a little bit of that today. You might not like the way you reacted to some of the events. You might not like uh, the effect lockdown had on you. So perhaps you maybe have backslidden in your faith. Maybe you feel a bit watered down spiritually. Well, the New Year prayer is a great time for us to say, God, I'm going to start out this year as I intend to continue. I need your help. Or maybe you're very low at this time because uh, lockdown in summer, we're still able to go out and about maybe for walks and the weather was nice. Lockdown in winter can be much harder. We get cabin fever. Maybe we feel quite low. New Year's Day prayer, Lord, help me this year. Help me look to you in spite of my circumstances. I hope you get the point. No matter what it is, where you are, where you have been, New Year gives us an opportunity to start afresh. And the wonderful news is that because Jesus forgives us, 
we can truly start afresh. So let's come before our God in prayer and ask for his help with that together now. Our Heavenly Father, we do come before you now in prayer, God, and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that things like COVID, cancer, dementia, depression, uh, the worst of things we can think of, do not stop your love being there for us. These things do not hold your love back. You love us through these things. You love us in spite of all our troubles and hardships. And Lord, sometimes we bring things on ourselves. You love us in spite of those. You love us in spite of our mistakes. And so, Lord, no matter how we feel today, no matter what is going on in our life, we, Lord, commit this year to you and ask, Lord, that you would help us live for your glory in it. Help us, Lord, to be those who are disciplined in reading and praying, those who are confident in your love and forgiveness, those who, Lord, feel spiritually alive through the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us, Father, for where we got it wrong last year. Forgive us for all the wrongs we have done. We need your forgiveness daily, Lord. And yet we're reminded that, Lord, your compassion and your mercy is fresh to us every day. So, Father, we come before you then in no, uh, such a variety of situations, different countries, different continents, different cultures. But, Lord, we come with the same problem of sin. And we need you, Lord, to be the solution to that problem. And so we thank you for Jesus Christ, your son, who died on the cross for us, who died to bring us hope of heaven to come, to bring us forgiveness for our sin, to bring us a washing clean from all our wrongdoing. Lord, bless us then as we go into this New Year's Day service. May it be one that glorifies you and encourages us as, Lord, we go into an uncertain year. Father, we thank you that despite the uncertainties, you are there and you are certain. Your word is certain. Your promises are certain. So help us hold on to them. Encourage us, our Father, we pray. Help us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to read together now, folks, and we're going to do so from a parable in Luke's gospel. And we're not going to necessarily be grounding ourselves in it today, but we will reference it. So just to set the tone of our service today, we read from Luke chapter 14. And here Jesus is telling a parable as he sat and there was a crowd around him. It says in verse 15 that one of the men at the crowd or one of those uh, at the table with him amongst this crowd said to Jesus... Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. So just a bit of context, the Old Testament talks about a feast to come in heaven, where all God's people will be around a great big table, there'll be a great banquet, and they will celebrate being in heaven. And so that's what he says there. He says, blessed is the one who will take part in the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, verse 16, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. Amen. May God bless that reading to us. What a year it's been, eh? What a year. 2020. That was a year that started like this year starting. One filled with hope, potential excitement. What might become? What might happen? What might we do? However, if we go way back to January last year, do you remember we had the Australian bushfires? Have you forgotten about that? We had the climate change protests. We had Greta Thunberg and Donald Trump having a fallout with each other. And then we had COVID, didn't we? COVID came along. It was a Chinese problem. And then it went to Italy. And then it came to us. 
Jumping into March, suddenly we were in lockdown. And so we thought, look, everyone's pretty much at home. Maybe things will just be quiet for a while. However, no, we still found ways to create problems for ourselves. We still found controversy. We had the fallouts of Dominic Cummings and the, the chief medical officer in Scotland. I forget her name now. They were breaking the rules. And then we had the, the murder of George Floyd and the, the racial uh, protests which came from that. Uh, fast forward on a little bit, we had the presidential election. I could be a little bit cheeky here and play some circus music. Because for many of us, we kind of felt like it was a bit of a circus show. No offence is meant to anyone uh, over the pond in America or any Americans watching. Don't mean that as offence, but it just seemed to kind of go on and on and it was all a bit bizarre. There was the recounting. Did he win? He's not admitting if he's lost. It, it was strange. Then, of course, we had Brexit still on the go. Oh, the dreaded word, Brexit. Finally, though, we thought the year might end well until the new variant of COVID hit. And here today, as I speak to you, we're back in lockdown, and it's almost as if nothing has changed. What a year. One to forget, many would say. However, I want to put it to you today that forgetting is a great thing when it comes to forgiveness and reconciliation, but it's a very silly thing to do when it comes to the past. We don't want to forget the past, we want to learn from the past. Because the past holds the wisdom for how we approach the future. And so what I wish to do with you today, friends, with our time here, is to learn a few lessons from 2020 that we can apply to 2021. When I first began to craft this and put it together, this sermon, I had many lessons we could learn, but time was getting stretched and we would have been here for a few hours. So I, I condensed it down to three lessons. However, then again, time was still being stretched and it could have lasted too long. And so I have just two lessons today to share with you. Two lessons we can learn, look into the past, that we can apply to our future. So what are they? Well, the first one is this. Jesus is the solution. Okay, 2020 was a year when we searched high and low for solutions to problems, didn't we? We had the, the problem of ill health still there with COVID and without it. it. Cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, all these things. What is the solution to them? Well, we were trying to find cures, weren't we? Then we realized we could also do a solution for bad attitudes. We had the brutal murder of George Floyd I mentioned a moment ago, the racism still going on in people's lives. People still faced with that issue. How, what's the solution to that? How do we get rid of it? Some propose that we kneel down and unite with one another. Did that make much of a difference? Was that the right solution? Then we had the whole cancel culture going on, didn't we? If someone didn't take a view that was deemed to be uh, so socially acceptable in this day and age, they were often cancelled or they were called out on it. J.K. Rowling would be one example of that. If you said something that was against gender fluidity, you would often be seen to be, uh, you know, called out on being arrogant or uneducated. You are ill-informed. Then we had the, the problem of keyboard warriors. We needed a solution to that one. You know, people, if you were on uh, social media, you would see people writing things that were poisonous, hatred. You know, how, how do we approach that? What do we do with it? What was the solution? Then you have things like lockdown, making marriages fall apart. What's the solution to that? Why are families being broken to pieces when they're meant to be together with one another, loving one another, what's the solution? Friends, there's so many things we could look at today, but we don't have time. Perhaps though, when we step back from it, we really begin to ask ourselves, what has happened to the world we live in? What has happened to our country? What's happened to our societies? Why are we so polarized? Why are we breaking down relationships all over the place? Why do we have so many issues? Well, you know, one of the things we can do today is we can come to God, who is called the great physician. He's like a doctor. He sees all the symptoms of the problems going on. He sees all the rumors of war. He sees the countries that can't agree, the families falling out, the selfishness of people stockpiling food at the expense of others. 
He sees the, the bitterness in the communities, the fallouts in families, and he can diagnose what the problem is. And so if we brought all these things of 2020 to God and said, God, why is all this happening? What is going on? He can help us by showing us what the issue really is. Psalm 135 says this, The idols of the nations are silver and gold, made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. That verse speaks of us serving idols. Don't think about the little waving cat in the Chinese. What God is really getting at is the idols in our hearts, the things we chase after, the things we long for, the things we pin our hopes to, the things we spend our life chasing down and seeking and desiring. So be it money, power, comfort. That's a big one in Scotland. People want more money to be comfortable. Respect, authority, contentment, whatever it may be, we chase these things, we serve them, we pull all our energy into obtaining these things. But what happens? Jonah 2.8 says that when we do these things, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. The more we chase after these things, the more we push God's love for us out of our lives. And the more we do that, we push also his design for our lives out as well. God is our creator. He created us to live in a certain way. He created us to do certain things. The more we push God out of our life and live with these things, the more we find brokenness coming into our lives. Friends, whenever you push God away, you bring in brokenness. Whenever you do something that God did not design you to do, you invite brokenness into your life. God says, I've made you male and female. We say, God, we don't need gender anymore. God says, then you're going to pick up some broken pieces which will come from that. God says, I've actually given everyone enough that you can all share and you can all have. What do we do? We, we hoard for ourselves. God says, you'll pick up the broken pieces. Marriage is about committing to another person in the sight of God for life. We say, marriage is just a piece of paper. You can tear it up when you want and move on. God says, well, you'll pick up the broken pieces. When you push me out of your life and you chase after all these other things, you end up with broken pieces. And friends, that's why this world is so broken. That's why this world has so many problems because they all come back to the fact that we have pushed God away and served other things. You know, the thing that I wish more people would realize is that it doesn't matter how much of those things that you're chasing after you get, they'll never truly make you happy. They'll never bring you what you really want. Idols are something we chase after, but they never deliver what we hope they would. If you want one simple example of this, let's take the easiest one of them all, money. Okay, there's the money trap. Have you heard of that? Somebody's earning a certain amount of money and they say to themselves, if I could only earn just a little bit more, then I'd be able to be a bit happier because then I'd have a little bit more to spend on these things. And so as time goes on, they earn a little bit more money, but then they begin to say to themselves, well, actually, if I could earn just a little bit more money, I'd be able to enjoy these things. And so they take whatever money they've got, they buy a bigger house, a bigger car, which costs more money, and then they need just a little bit more money every month to take the pressure off. If they can get that, then they would be happy. I think COVID showed many people that they idolized their work. If you'd gone back to January 2020 and said to some people, how would you like three months off fully paid? They would say, I'd love that. Oh, I'd love that. That would be amazing. Then what happened? Furlough came along and some people were fortunate enough to have full pay, three months off. And what did you find? You found they were miserable. They wanted to be back at work. Why? Because that's where they were searching for their happiness. That's what they found their identity in. That's what they pinned their hopes to. Working, building their businesses, becoming bigger, getting more money, being more comfortable. But along the way, God says every time, when you serve those things, when you worship those things, when you pin your hopes to those things, you push my love out of your life, 
You push my design for your life out and it leaves you broken. And so friends, when you look around the world, you are simply seeing the broken pieces which reflect how we as humanity have pushed God away. And that's why I firmly believe that the solution to 2021 is that we turn to Jesus. He is the solution. John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. That's what Jesus said. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. I am the one who can show you the way to heaven. I'm the one who can show you the way to live. I am the truth, the one who tells you what is true about you, the one who tells you how to live, the one who tells you how you were created to be. And he says, I am the one who gives you life eternal and life to the fullest. Jesus is the one who can heal the racial tensions of this world because he reminds us we're all created in the sight of God equal. Jesus is the one who can heal broken marriages because he's the one who teaches us how to forgive and reconcile. Jesus is the one who's the solution to the keyboard warrior because he says to them, before you type that sunshine, are you perfect? Are you without sin? Take a look at yourself, he says. And ultimately, Jesus is the solution for us because he tears down those idols which never fulfill us, never bring us the contentment we want, and he gives us the things we truly desire. It's said that we have a a hole in our hearts and it's a God-shaped hole. And we try to fill it with all these things that we talked about, all these idols of money and power and success, but it never fills the hole. So we always want more. Jesus is the solution because he's the one who fills the hole. And so friends, I believe if we look back to 2020 and we see all the brokenness, we begin to learn that the solution we really need is Jesus Christ. And if we want to move into 2021 and we want to have a brighter future, we want to have hope of eternity for when we die, we want to have forgiveness, reconciliation with God and with one another, then we need to bring Jesus back to being the one we follow and worship. Our first lesson, I think, looking back to 2020, is that our real solution is found in Jesus. So that's our first point for today. Let's go on to our second lesson of 2020. And that is that I believe we learn that fellowship is important. Okay, we learn about the importance of fellowship. You see, March 23rd, Boris Johnson says we're going into lockdown. What happens is that our churches, which normally have a service at Uh, 11 and 5 or 6 or whenever it is, you get the idea, one at either end of the Sunday and a midweek meeting of some sort, they all close. And so suddenly we have to become an online virtual church. But if you really start to think about it, only one thing really changed, didn't it? I mean, yes, we had to close the buildings and all that kind of stuff, but only one thing really changed. Follow me uh, as we think about this. When you normally come to church on a Sunday, you will uh, come in and you'll sit in a chair and you'll rise up to possibly stand and sing. There'll be some words on the overhead projector. Doesn't matter if you're tone deaf or you're classically trained, makes no difference in church because it's about the heart of worship. It's not a performance. And then what happens is we often have a kid's talk. And so, you know, we out, we'll have maybe some sweets, magic talk, we'll maybe have a prop of some sort. We'll talk with the kids. After that, there'll be a time of prayer and we'll all pray together. Uh, And then we'll read the Bible. And then there'll be a sermon like now. And then there'll be a singing at the end. Now think about it. What has changed? Because you still have that, don't you? You can still sing at home. You can still read the Bible as it comes up on the screen. You can hear the sermon. The, The kids still have their section. And so some people may say, well, the only real change, Dan, is that you can't know if I'm sleeping. And that's true, I don't know. But being serious, the only real change for a moment is that you're not having fellowship, isn't it? You're still able to sing, you're still able to read, you're still able to pray, you're still able to hear the sermon and be fed in your faith, but what you don't have, the one thing that has changed is that you don't 
have fellowship with one another. And if you talk to any seasoned Christian, they will tell you that is the one thing they are missing. They are missing the part where they come to church and someone is there to welcome them at the door. Great to see you. How are you doing? They're missing the conversations they would have over tea and coffee and cake and biscuits, talking about their faith. How are you getting on? Can I pray for you? They're missing coming to the midweek prayer meeting and being able to pray for one another and pray together. You see, friends, online virtual church is great and it has its place and it has its merits. But it does not give you the one experience that God designed you to have. Fellowship with one another. Listen to these verses. You'll see how important this is. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. You can't encourage one another and build one another up without fellowship. Hebrews uh, 10, very well known verse. Uh, verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Friends, go through the New Testament and you'll see over and over and over again that God designed us for fellowship. We are not designed as human beings for isolation. You know, a, a news report surfaced two weeks ago, maybe now. And it was one of those scientific studies that comes out where you read it and we always say to ourselves, uh, well, we knew that. It's no news. You know, it's like when they, they say, oh, scientists have discovered that smoking is bad for you. Well, we knew that. <laughs> or, you know, they say, oh, scientists have discovered that running 10, day, 10 minutes a day is better for you than not running at all. Really? We knew that. Well, this study was one of those because the study came out and it said, guess what? Scientists have discovered that isolation isn't good for us as human beings. And of course, we know that, don't we? We know isolation's not good. We know not seeing one another's not good. I mean, just look at uh, prisons. They threaten prisoners with isolation. That's what you see on all the films all the time. Why? Because you know being cut off from one another is worse to be put in solitary confinement is worse because you can't have uh, talking, can't laugh, can't enjoy one another's company. It's exactly the same with us. We were made for fellowship with one another. We were made for fellowship with God and with each other. You know, we said earlier that, you know, uh, when you push God out of your life, you replace him with something else that breaks us, it leaves us with broken pieces. When we push God out of our life, it breaks our relationship with him. We don't have fellowship with him. Well, Jesus came to restore that. And so when we ask Jesus to forgive us, we have a relationship with God restored. We have fellowship with him. That's what we were designed for. And then as you have that, you're brought into the family of God and you have fellowship with all the other believers. Think about it. This is the end goal for every Christian, isn't it? To have fellowship with God and one another. After all, that's what heaven is. You know, sometimes heaven is kind of portrayed as floating on clouds. Oh, we're up there. We've got wings like angels. We're floating on clouds. But that's not heaven. Heaven is being with every other believer, worshipping God. Fellowship with one another and fellowship with our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God. That's why we read about that parable of the banquet. Jesus told us, and the Bible tells us throughout, that heaven, there'll be a great banquet, a great feast. We don't use the word banquet. You know, we don't use that word at all unless we're going to the Chinese banquet. That sometimes it'd be used. We talk about great meals. Jesus says there's going to be a great meal in heaven for all those who have followed him, for all those who have asked him for forgiveness. And we will eat with one another and with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will have fellowship with one another and with him. Jesus said on the night he was betrayed, he gave the, the last supper. He said, I will not drink off the vine. I won't have any of this wine until that great banquet in heaven. When the church celebrates communion, it's pointing us towards that great feast we will one day have in heaven. 
And think about it, a meal, a feast is only great when you have it with other people, isn't it? Well, some of us may have had to have Christmas meal, a uh, Christmas dinner on our own. And I know that would have been hard for you because you long for someone to share it with. I spoke to many people who were going to be by themselves and they said, well, what's the point of buying a turkey and all the trimmings when you've got no one to share it with? The hope of the Bible is that everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ will one day share in a meal in heaven with God and with one another. All those who have put their faith in Jesus. Why? Because that is ultimately what God made us for. Fellowship with himself and fellowship with one another. Looking back to 2020, we still got online all the things that we normally get. We still got the sermon, we still got the singing, the praying, the Bible reading, but what we missed out on was the glue that holds it together. The fellowship the coming together with one another. And the Bible says when you do that, God's spirit is with us. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, I will be with you. The Holy Spirit permeates through his people, convicting, calling, rejoicing, encouraging, and building us up in our faith. So perhaps 2020 reminded us of the importance to meet together. I cannot wait till we can open our buildings and we can get rid of the face masks and we can have fellowship with one another and we can be reminded that this is what heaven will be like, being with one another and with our Lord and Saviour. So perhaps in 2021, you want to make a New Year's resolution. It would be this then, to come out to church when it opens, to share with one another, to talk with one another about our faith, to be an encouragement to one another and to let others be an encouragement to us. Not to run out the door when the service finish, but to stick around and share in life together. Because after all, that's what God designed us for. Friends, my time is up. The two lessons, Jesus is the solution and fellowship is important. Minnie Louise Haskins caught the attention of King George when she wrote so eloquently. And I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. I think 2021 is a year that right now may look dark. Brexit, COVID, medical issues, political uncertainty, unemployment, and so on. Let's go, though, into this new year, putting our hand into the hand of God. He is our solution. He is the one who wants fellowship with us and gives us fellowship with one another. He is the one who will stick with us and lead us, ultimately, to an eternity with himself. A great meal in heaven where we rejoice and all the pains of this life are left in the grave. God bless you all for this coming year. And I'll hopefully see many of you in the months to come. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these few thoughts that we can consider today. Help us, Lord, to put you first this year and to follow you continually each and every day. Lord, let you be our solution. Let, Lord, us push the idols out of our lives and bring you into our lives. Lord, please show us where these things lead us. Show us how serving money and comfort and happiness, Lord, we never really get it. We always want more. Lord, show us and open our eyes that you are the solution that we are longing for. And you are the one who willingly died to be that solution to our sin. Father, encourage us, Lord, to be those uh, to be people of fellowship, to be those who share our lives with one another, encouraging one another and being encouraged by one another. We long, Lord, to reopen our church doors and have fellowship with one another. So, Father, please bring that day and bring it soon. Guard us and keep us then, our Lord. Help us in all that we do, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to conclude our service, friends, by singing. And as usual, the words will be, on the screen for you. 
to thank you for tuning in today and joining with us. I do hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I do wish you uh, God's richest blessing for the new year. Until we do see one another uh, again, please do take care, stay safe, God bless you and as always, keep the faith. Bye for now.